Hello, glorious comrades. Today we're going to talk about the inheritance of single gene traits in chapter five. Okay. So uh, we are going to do all the uh, boxes and content in this chapter, so definitely keep an eye on those and take some good notes. All right, here we go. So kind of an overview here, uh, just since I'm not going to assume that GenBio is sticking too hard, let's review. So genes have two important functions. Key one is that they're inherited, they're something passed down from parent to child, and then they are expressed. The gene actually codes for something that uh, contributes to a phenotype. Okay? Now genes are sections of DNA that are located at a defined position on a chromosome, so that is called the locus, so you'll hear gene locus, uh, plural being loci. Okay? Uh, changing the DNA, the sequence uh, within the gene, such as any kind of mutation, like we've heard about in chapter three, results in changes in morphology and phenotype. Now, diploids, most multicellular organisms are diploid, have two copies of every gene. And then the last sort of overview thing is that genes uh, have different alleles, different versions of the same gene. And those are ex written as either a uppercase or a lowercase letter. And uppercase usually indicates that the that allele is dominant over the other. And if we have a heterozygote, uh, you either write it with a slash in between the two different uh, letters or just together. And we always have the capital letter first. Okay, onwards. So a little bit more terminology. Uh, our phenotype, again, that's our trait that can be identified or measured, and that's determined by a combination of your genotype and the environment. And then our genotype is that uh, genetic constitution or the genetic makeup, the actual DNA sequence underlying the phenotype. And then finally our gene is our unit of inheritance there and our allele is an alternative form of gene. And we could have just one allele, in which case that allele is said to be fixed in the population and that there aren't any other variants floating around. We could have two variants uh, or just many, um, five, six, seven, but two is what we're gonna work with when we're talking about um, you know, just if we have one dominant and one recessive gene. So a little more terminology before we dive in. Our dominant allele, uh, we define that as the allele or gene that expresses over the recessive allele when it occurs in a heterozygote. Okay. So hetero means different. So a heterozygote has different alleles one on each uh, chromosome there. So our capital and our, for our dominant allele and a lowercase r for our lower allele, recessive allele. And we're always going to put the dominant one first, and I'm going to try to use letters that look different uh, in upper and lower case. It's not always the case, because sometimes, say, for the white gene in uh, Drosophila, W is the standard terminology, and we're just going to have to stick with that. Okay? And then some, an individual can also be homozygous, so homo meaning same. Okay, so homozygous dominant means you have two copies of the dominant allele, and then homozygous recessive, meaning you have two copies of the recessive allele. And another term we're going to use a lot is carrier. So if an individual is heterozygous, they are carrying, maybe that recessive allele is um, detrimental, but it's not going to be expressed uh, because in the heterozygous, it'll only be expressed in the homozygous recessive. But um, Carrier is a term referring to a heterozygous individual that has a deleterious recessive allele that they are carrying but not expressing. So Gregor Mendel, I'm sure you've all heard of him as this kind of founder of the science of genetics, and he studied true breeding peas and crossed them and diligently logged the uh, results of his crosses and following them and not only uh, to the offspring, but to the grandchildren of the original cross to see how these traits were segregating and moving around in the population. Yeah. And so the key here is that he wrote it down. Science isn't science unless you write it down. And uh, the fact that he journaled all these uh, just meticulously, carefully curated crosses, um, and there is some controversy, and you'll see one of the boxes about, is this data too good? But when you're working with um, very large numbers of uh, individuals, you can have some very good stats coming out of it. So, but we'll discuss it a little bit later. So how exactly did Mendel do these crosses? Well, he basically um, would remove the male parts from the mother plant that he was gonna use, and then uh, hand pollinate. So use a little brush to pick up some pollen from the male parent and put that on the carpal the purple flower sort of um, preventing self-fertilization and getting the cross he wanted. And then the carpal would mature into a pod, and then he would save and plant those seeds, and then he would have the offspring from that original cross. So 
Mendel was kind of lucky in that he picked an organism that, that was diploid and not like tetraploid or something, a plant here, and um, that he followed traits that ended up having just a clear dominant recessive pattern. So flower color, uh, purple expresses uh, dominantly over white, flower position, axial expresses dominantly over terminal, and so on. The, the traits up here are the dominant traits, and then the traits on the bottom are the recessive traits. And so the fact that he was able to find these um, traits that were true, ble true breeding and just had simple discrete uh, phenotypes was really important for the success of his experiments. He tried to do this with bees later in another type of flower and didn't have success just because they're, they're much more complicated. So it's possible that many other people had tried to do progeny testing but were working with the wrong organism or they didn't keep good enough records and we just didn't know about them. But Mendel's the one who wrote it all down. And thus we have his data to, to look at that he was able to synthesize his conclusions from. Okay. So when I say true breeding variety, uh, it means that all the offspring are like the parent for that trait. Okay. So if you have two green peas and the offspring are all green and you keep breeding those and they just never go back to yellow or they never change, then you would consider a true breeding variety. Uh, now we know that those are generally uh, homozygous. Okay. There's no other allele in that population sort of uh, forming any heterozygotes. It's just all what we'll call true breeding. Okay. And so when you cross, if you've got these varieties that you're relatively sure, you know, are true breeding for this trait and you cross them in the first generation, you don't see much of all happening. You see one trait becoming dominant over the other. And then if you self fertilize that uh, second generation there, you see that, oh, that recessive trait, the one that has had receded has now coming back out. Okay, and this is what he was following and analyzing and um, working on. Okay, so you have this interesting three quarters displaying um, that dominant trait and a one quarter displaying that recessive trait. So this is where he was starting. Now, real quick, uh, let's do some terminology on how to indicate what generation we're talking about. And we've got the parental. Okay, so we note that with a P, the very start of the cross. And then the next generation is called the F generation or the following ones for filial, which comes from filius filia, and that's Latin for son or daughter. So the, the basically the son daughter generation, filial generation. And the first one is called the F1, okay, the offspring of the parents. And if we go another generation down the with the um, F1 crossing itself, we get the second filial generation, the F2, that's our grandchildren of the original cross. And then finally, you can keep going, the F3, the F4, the F5, but we're pretty much going to focus on uh, the parental generation and then the first and second filial generations. Okay. Also, just a quick review of dominant recessive here, Okay, how we terminology. So we're going to have the capital letters first. Uh, you're going to see this in flies a lot where we actually put a slash between the two letters just to make it clear. Uh, wild type will often get denoted as either um, the letter of the mutation we're looking at with a plus sign like this, the A plus, or it could just be a plus sign on its own just to uh, sort of save space. The wild type always comes first again in the cross. And then if we don't particularly care what the um, following letter is if, or if we don't know, if we just know the phenotype is dominant and then it could be another dominant allele or a recessive allele, uh, we'll leave a little underscore here. Okay, so that's usual to help hold the mark there. And then when we have multiple alleles, uh, we denote these with a superscript letter. Okay, so in this case, this is blood type alleles, and we have the um, A antigen uh, allele, the B antigen allele, and the uh, null antigen allele here. And so this one is actually recessive to the other two, but uh, for multiple alleles, there are other ways of, of denoting it, but this is probably the most common form we're going to see. Okay. And we're going to use the superscript for denoting between these guys, which of course I'm going to show you when PowerPoint is being a jerk, won't work. So here's an example of point coloration in cats. And uh, there's this enzyme called tyrosinase. It's the very first step in pigment production. So if this enzyme gets warped, then you're not going to have any pigment deposited in the cat's hair. Right? So the um, kind of wild type or um, common allele here is the C allele, capital C, and it just full pigment production everywhere. Um, you're going to see a strong pigment. Okay? 
And then the next allele we have is one called CB, and that should be superscript. The PowerPoint won't let me because it's being injured. Where it has, a, it's a temperative uh, conditional mutation, a temperature sensitive mutation, where this enzyme only functions in cold uh, regions of the cat, or, or functions well in cold regions, and it functions kind of if in the warmer regions. You start seeing the coldest places on the cat, like the tail, the feet. Uh, the face and the ears having the darkest coloration. And so then this is for Burmese, CB is for the Burmese coloration, which is here. And next we have CS for Siamese, uh, where we have a severe temperature sensitive mutation. Uh, literally tyrosinase has, has been mutated and it only works in those areas where um, of cold temperature, relatively cold temperature, and does not express in the other areas. And then we have um, the last allele here called uh, just C without any, it's the, the, the least dominant or the most recessive of these alleles, where it's just a nonsense mutation. Uh, tyrosinase is completely broken because of the early start stop codon, and we just don't have any pigment coloration at all. There's actually multiple ways to have um, albino cats, uh, and this is one of them because it just stops the process uh, in the beginning. So that's kind of our demonstration of multiple alleles here, and uh, which we're not going to work with too much until we get to, I think, chapter eight or nine, but I did want to go over it real quick. Okay, so we'll go to the next part shortly.